Welcome everyone. Okay. Um, so, um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, so, I have a imposter alert first. I'm not a humanist. That's not my academic background. I'm a social scientist. So it's very interesting, my journey over the last five years working for the labs. Um, so I'm going to go through a sort of chronological journey up to about 2016. And I'm going to try to highlight things that we learned in that process that we think you might find useful. Okay? So um, I joined uh, mid-March 2013. And five days later, we had a launch event to launch a competition. <clears throat> That was, yeah, interesting. Um, and I think for the first few months, uh, I felt like I was going through Alibaba's cave, um, hunting for digital collections that we could use as part of the competition. So the idea of the competition was it was going to be open. We wanted people to come up with ideas of what to do with our collections. We would then choose two winners very, very early on in the project. I recognized that the, the original plan, um, there was a little bit of a risk because we were going to choose, uh, the original plan said one winner per year. And I thought, well, let's say if we choose a winner and it's not very good. So um, we chose two and we actually added an element of competition, which was they only get their prize money at the very end when they've done their work. Okay, it's quite evil but it worked. Um, so I just wanted to, the, 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 the sort of Alibaba's cave analogy um, was like, that was my journey at the beginning of the British Library. So I came in with this torch of energy and enthusiasm looking for treasure in Alibaba's cave. First I need to know the password, okay, open sesame. And then I was hunting through the cave. I would see glimmers of things that I thought were gold and they turned out to be mirages. Sometimes there was gold, but there was somebody standing there saying, I'm sorry, you can't use that. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there was a door, you knocked on the door, nobody opened the door. Uh, sometimes there was just gold and you could just take it, okay? As much as you could carry. Um, but what very quick, you know, when I first started the library, I realized what my own agenda was. And I felt it was about opening the doors to the collections. I felt really passionate about that. And one thing I'd just like to sort of say, I don't, it's not on my slides, is go with your passion. That was my passion. I think that's driven me for the last five years. Um, so, um, really kind of from the seed had started from the very beginning and basically we started to kind of do much more engagement than we originally planned. One interesting thing that we did was when people submitted their ideas to the competition, we went through the legal arrangements and we realized that actually they, if they, they could own their own IP, their own intellectual property, if they submitted their ideas as independent researchers, not tied to their affiliations, their institutional affiliations, which is quite interesting. And also, this was the, the, the tricky one, was the terms and conditions, some people didn't read them, was if they submit their ideas, they have to agree to share them even if they don't win, okay? And that was very important for us because we needed to sell our collections very difficult to sell collections when it's kind of abstract. If you've got concrete ideas of what to do with them, it's much easier to do. That's one thing that we learned very, very quickly. So we started really what we call now the road shows, okay? Uh, it's nothing fancy. We haven't got a van, okay, with a British library on, on the side. But what we do is we go around the country and we talk to people. And it's really hard work. <coughs> There is no magic bullet, there's no magic formula. You talk and talk and talk until somebody connects with you. It's that easy, but also hard. And really what we found was, as we were doing this talking, the original aims of the project, which were to experiment with our digital collections. I mean, the British Library is a preeminent research library in the world. We think it's the largest library in the world. I think the Library of Congress might argue with that. Um, <laughs> we'll have a fight later about, about that. Um, but, what we realized was actually, we were starting to engage with all these other people as well. They were just, just coming to us and wanting to do things with our collections, which was amazing. Uh, and this is the trick, okay? We're coming with our collections and they're coming with their interests. And it's trying to find where the intersection is, okay? 
And that's where I think the labs works, in that intersection. We have our collections, they have their interests. Is there anything that we can do together? That bit in the middle is the really, really hard work. And it really does start with a conversation. So um, Adam mentioned a, a collection um, that was cleared through access and reuse, Microsoft books, 65,000 digitized books from the 19th century. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about that story, about how that had a huge impact, because that was made public domain. And really for us, we were looking for an example of a collection that we could make public domain and then do really interesting, impactful things with. And this is, the, this, this is our, our rock star collection, really. We have so many examples that we've done with this particular collection because of that one thing about making this collection public domain. So I went, I remember I went to my first roadshow at Nottingham, University of Nottingham, to lots of blank faces, okay? People said, hmm, yes, interesting, okay? And I just I was feel, I'm feeling a bit disillusioned on the train, tired, I'd use lots of energy, you know, enthusiasm, the torch, okay? And I sat next to a professor of uh, Latin American studies on the train. She said, oh, Mahendra, you know this is a collection of Microsoft books. I'm sure there are Latin American titles in that collection. And I said, well, I have no idea, okay? And she said, well, could you send me a list? And I said, I'll send you a spreadsheet. She said, I don't do spreadsheets, okay? <laughs> so, this is, this is my souvenir. This is the actual thing that I did. I printed out the spreadsheet, I posted it to her, she highlighted them on yellow marker pens, brought it back, I identified 1,200 digitized titles, she then worked with a computer scientist on a pilot project at the University of Nottingham. That's what engagement means, okay? Doesn't have to be fancy. So, um, we launched the competition, we did, we did some engagement. Uh, it was just me then, Ben started in August. Lonely time that was, I can tell you, okay? Um, but we announced the winners in July, and what we, what we learned was, that okay, they're now gonna work on their projects for about six months, okay? And that's become the chosen time for academics to work on our projects. They basically have to give up their holidays, okay? But we think it's because of they want to work with the British Library, they do it, and they do it willingly. Uh, and this is, this is the biggest thing that we learned was the researchers became researchers in residence, which meant they have to be security cleared. It means they can have the same access as staff can have. And I said, aha, an on-site solution to access to our collections. I'm keeping that one, okay? Um, and then we worked to have a symposium in November to show the world what they did. So the symposium adds a kind of a pressure because people have to deliver something and tell the world. And I remember the very first year, we, it was literally four o'clock in the morning, finishing off things on tools to show to this 300 people in a, in, a, in a room. This was the very first, one of our very first winners. I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Peter Francois from the University of Oxford. He wants to develop a tool which analyzed 19th century metadata uh, by sample size. So you could, you could say, I want to find 30 examples of things that you have in your collection. And also to include our digitized collection, so which was for the 19th century about 3%. Um, what we learned from his work was that, oh my God, our digital collections are not representative of our physical collections. I know that sounds obvious, but we kind of thought, yes, that's actually really important for scholars because if they make conclusions on their research, they need to know what it's based on. That's just a, an example slide demonstrating that. Dan Norton was doing a PhD researcher. He was also a DJ. And his idea was to mix our collections to create new artwork. And we worked with him, it was a very ambitious project, but the one thing we learned from his project was it's really important that items have a unique URL. That was the one major thing we learned. I know that sounds obvious, but sometimes the obvious things are, are, are the really important things. And that's an example of his interface. Both Peter and um, Dan went on to do, uh, build on their work with labs. Uh, in about the same year, we kind of felt uh, we should eat our own dog food. And what that means is, if we're promoting experimentation, we should maybe do it ourselves. And as a team, we started to run some experiments. We ran a hack day, somebody called Matt Pryor, 
thought of an idea to do with the Microsoft books. He said, oh, you could cut the, you could cut the pictures out of these books. So uh, Ben ran some experiments and decided scissors and books digitally, not physically, so don't panic, librarians amongst you. Um, <coughs> let's do it algorithmically. And this is what we did. We, we cut out the pictures, we ran an experiment using face recognition software to see if the pictures were faces. The problem we had was the software was based on photographic imagery and these were illustrations. So it was good at recognizing women, but not men. Uh, the mechanical curator was born. It was a Tumblr account, which is existence, it's still in existence today. It posts a cutout image from the books every 30 minutes. And it also has a brain, so it chooses, tries to find eight similar images. And the, the response was incredible. So we thought, people said, we want all these images. How many are there? There were one million images. We approached Wikimedia. They said, we're not having that. You're going to have a million images dumped onto Wikimedia and without any metadata? Are you kidding? Okay. <laughs> so we ended up going for Flickr Commons. And it met our requirements because every image has a unique URI and it has an API. That's, that's what we've always wanted from the beginning of the project. And that's, our, that's the big, biggest piece of advice I can give you. Okay. The other advantage was Flickr had a tagging interface. So we were going into a tagging experiment or crowdsourcing. There was lots of press and incredible creative uses. That's a skateboard that was developed using one of our images, and that's a card game. But this is the magic of what happens when you open up your collections. Uh, I didn't get time to put images on these slides. But uh, this, is uh, this is in 2014. We had our competition's winners were Bob Nicholson. And his idea was the Victorian meme machine. And this was finding jokes in our digitized newspapers. And um, what we learned from that was actually getting access to licensed material isn't always straightforward. That was the big lesson we learned. Another, another a, a project from Australia that was very interesting doing the Skype calls, um, that was called the text to image linking tool. And that was linking um, text in manuscripts to transcripts, but making sure it's on the same horizontal plane, because sometimes the transcripts are paginated differently. So it was solving quite a simple, but actually really important user interface problem. At the same time, as we released the Flickr images, um, David Normal, an artist from California, started to bring those images together and start to collage them and make them into paintings. He then made, he blew them up into light boxes at a festival called Burning Man in 2014. More about him in a minute, okay? At the same time, we worked with the AHRC, the Arts Humanities Research Council, and uh, there was a big call for big data projects, and some of them could use our data. Uh, we ended up working with at least three projects, amounting to about 1.5 million pounds. Um, the Digital Music Lab project, which was analyzing our in copyright world and traditional music recordings. Uh, Palimpsest, which was uh, using text and images um, from our Microsoft books. And Lost Illustrations, which was another project which was looking at tagging the images from our 19th century books. Uh, another project we worked on was with a startup company, uh, somebody called Peter Bullman, who developed a tool to find out what's happened to our images in terms of how people are reusing them. And there was lots of really interesting work on, on our maps, finding our maps on Flickr. People were tagging lots of maps, lots of activity around maps. Uh, so that's just some examples, just some screenshots. That's something that we developed out of Bob's work on the Victoria Mean Machine. Basically, we developed something called um, the uh, Mechanical Comedian, which publishes a really bad Victorian joke every day and hopes to, we hope to see what the response of social media is. <laughs> Okay. Uh, that's a project called uh, uh, Black Abolitionists, which was trying to find black abolitionist speeches in newspapers, and that's just a screenshot of the Digital Music Lab project. This is just, uh, uh, I haven't got time to go into this, but this is the tool that Peter, Peter Baldwin developed, which is a kind of a digital dashboard to see what happens to public domain images. Have a guess what was the number one use of our public domain images? People were reselling them. Okay. Um, phase two, um, myself and uh, Adam worked together. We've decided we're going to keep the competition, but we're going to add awards. 
Rowley Keating launches the Living Knowledge Vision in 2015, and the Alan Turing Institute just about to sort of happen. Uh, our awards, our awards are different to our competition. Our awards are, tell us what you've already done with our collection, so you've already done the work. So it's really important to do this because we can then provide more examples to inspire people to do things with our collections. If you actually go out and talk to researchers, those conversations are really quite hard. And if you can bring examples to the table, it's much more powerful to do that. Uh, we had our research winners in 2015 were looking for disease in 19th century newspapers, digitized newspapers. Mario Klingerman, an artist, called himself a code artist, was doing really interesting things with our Flickr images. Dina Malkova won our commercial prize. She took an, uh, a, a snapshot of an illustration and made bow ties and sold them in our shop. Um, and there was lots of sterling work being done with our maps on Flickr. Uh, then I worked with David Normal um, to bring his artwork from Burning Man to the <coughs> British Library. And we had a big party. That was hard work. Uh, our symposium got bigger. And then we thought, OK, we're going to launch a portal called data.bl.uk. Very simple, no API, where you can just download our stuff in big chunks. Our winners that year were Crowdsource Arcade, which was basically using an arcade machine to, develop, to, to use gaming to make tagging fun. And Political Meetings Mapper, which was finding political meetings in digitized newspapers. So we get building an experience of working with digitized newspapers. That seemed to be where our trajectory was going. And um, what we found was, if the expert has domain knowledge, it makes the whole process really easy in terms of finding stuff. Uh, Katrina knew exactly which newspaper, which page, which column. Easy. Okay. Um, Hannah, who was looking for black abolitionist speeches, those speeches could be anywhere in the newspapers. Insanely difficult computational problem. Okay. Uh, that's the Crowdsource Arcade, that's Political Meetings Mapper. Uh, that's the artwork that David Normal did, that's at Burning Man, that's at the British Library. We built an app where you could identify images from the painting that would take you back to the page in the book where the images came from. That's my, uh, Mario Klingerman's work, he was our Artistic Award winner, that's 44 men who have 44, who looked 44. Um, <laughs> he did that for his 44th birthday. These are 19 tragic looking women he found in our archive computationally. And this is my favorite. A hat on the ground spells trouble. <laughs> All done computationally. Uh, in phase two, we, we carried on doing more road shows in 2016. The winners were this time Sherlock Net, three 19-year-olds from Stanford who used artificial intelligence and a little bit of ground, human ground truth to try to identify all one million images on Flickr. If you go to the Flickr interface, you'll see tags developed by them called SherlockNet. They also try to caption images. Some were successful, some were interesting. Um, also, the Black Abolitionist Project, which I've already spoken about. And really, what I wanted to sort of characterize was we, we were beginning to understand our research pattern, our, val of our valuable research pattern, which was finding and identifying things in messy data. Our research award that year was Citizen Paste, digitized newspapers. That seems to be a bit of a theme. Um, our commercial winner was, um, so Citizen Paste was looking for evidence of copy and paste in 19th century newspapers. Uh, commercial was Biblioboard, which is a commercial app developed to show our Microsoft books. Um, what we began to realize was we were having an international reach so our artistic award winner was a very beautiful and sweet music video called Hey There Young Sailor, and it came from Malaysia. Just, just came in through the inbox one day, and it was, it was so, it's so beautiful. Uh, and we also started to develop a teaching and learning award. And the uh, library carpentry, which was developed by James Baker, who was a former colleague at the British Library, was all about teaching librarians data skills. And this was a really important part we launched a staff award, an award for our own staff to recognize their own efforts in the digital space. Uh, and we then launched data.bl and we continue to look at the technical side to support the international image interoperability framework. So I think Adam, do you sit on the, com uh, the committee? 
Yeah. So that's the data.bl.uk portal. And there's no API, but you can download lots of files. The largest file is half a terabyte. Okay. Each data set has its own digital object identifier as well. In 2017, we supported two competition finalists, Jennifer Batt, again, digitized 19th century, 18th century newspapers, and she was trying to find poetry in those newspapers. It was a very interesting challenge. And I, I've been working with an artist called Michael Takio Magruder for the last two and a half years, and his idea uh, to the library was called Imaginary Cities. And what Michael's idea was, he wanted to take the digitized maps that are on Flickr, especially the city maps, and they, you have, they're, they're on Flickr, but they also have live data around them. So they have views and tags, and he wanted to take that live data and the digitized map and transform them into two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and VR works. And some examples of some of his work. Michael's very interested in materiality. He's sitting at the back there, just you can wave. Sorry, sorry, Michael, I didn't want to embarrass you, but you're, you're giving a lightning talk later anyway. So um, uh, this is gold and silver gilding. Um, so taking the digital work back into the physical. And we have a sort of special announcement. Michael's going to have an exhibition at the British Library in, in uh, next year, between the 4th and the 14th of July. It'll be free. Uh, we're going to have a big party to, to launch it, or during it, we're, we're going to have an algo rave. Google it. <laughs> <clears throat> so Michael's been experimenting with, um, with, with collaborators on um, taking some of this into a VR environment. And I just want to just finally finish before I hand back to Adam, what the biggest lesson we learned was, as the years went by, the competition entries got better because people could see previous competition entries. And what we learned was, look at the data first before you submit ideas. Because people often make assumptions about the data. Look at it, explore it, characterize it, and then come up with a research question that you can actually answer or, or try to achieve. Most people's research questions change radically once they actually explore the data. And this is some work that we're doing now. And what we've decided to do is we've stopped the competition, but we're still providing support for, um, for people to sort of incubate their ideas and develop them further. Almost like taking those ideas and putting them back into reality. So back to, um, so just to finish off, um, a little stat for you. Since we launched Flickr in 2013, we've had over a billion views. 17 and a half million tags have been added. And what's interesting is there's more demand to see some of the physical items. So on that note of demand, I'm going to hand over back to Adam.